Uh, I would like to welcome you all. Uh, my name is Kees Leijenhorst. I would like to welcome you to this uh, evening organized by Radboud Reflex in conjunction with the Center for Contemporary European Philosophy um, at the Faculty of Philosophy, Theology, Religious Studies uh, of this uh, uh, university. A very intelligent topic we're going to deal with today, namely um, stupidity. Um, now, stupi stupid is something that is part of our um, calling our, our, other people names. It's a slur. You are stupid. It's very much a disqualification of the person that you're talking to. It's the economy, stupid. One famous US presidential candidate once uh, said, and he didn't mean very well. Um, so... What is stupidity then really? Is it just calling each other names? Or is stupidity, stupidity something more than that? Is it a deeper kind of characteristic of our existence? Is it, perf if it, is it really so bad to be stupid? Or could it be okay to be stupid? Um, could we even say that we should embrace our stupidity to have a more fulfilled life. Um, well, that in any case is the position that's going to be defended tonight by our speaker, Annabelle Dufour, who is a dear colleague of mine at the uh, Faculty of Philosophy and Theology and Religious Studies <laughs> <laughs> of uh, this, um, uh, this university. But as of today, she is also the Socrates Professor at Wageningen. Uh, university. Oh, so many congratulations to, uh, for that. Um, um, she's going to speak to us about this subject for about, well, exactly 40 minutes. Um, then we'll have a, a discussion. Annabelle and I will discuss the themes that she will bring up during uh, uh, the talk. Uh, and then it the, will be time for you to ask questions, but I'll get back to you because there is a small procedure uh, for that, which I'm going to explain to you when the time is there. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Annabelle. Thank you. Thank you, Case, for this uh, uh, introduction. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, and so, yes, without further ado, <laughs> Let's get to it. Uh, of course, I couldn't start without him. <laughs> uh, so are we all getting Denver? Of course, this has been also, Trump has been part of the conversations about stupidity during the past years. It's definitely brought the subject back, for sure. Um, and I would like to start with a little poll. Um, so have you ever called someone else stupid? And have you ever called yourself stupid? Uh, well... Have you ever called anyone else stupid? Yes. <laughs> wow, not that many. I would, I would, I would have bet on more. Have you ever called yourself stupid? Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's pretty common, right? Uh, I think it's indeed part of our existence. Uh, uh, what we mean with that is another question. Another question is: Does any of the above mean that you are smart? That's a little bit of a provocation here, because first, if you call someone else stupid, it probably means that you know better. Um, but on the other hand, calling someone stupid, as Case was saying, is indeed an insult. So is it really smart to insult people? I'm not sure. So uh, that's indeed an open question. Same for oneself. When I call myself stupid, well, uh, there is a part of myself who knows better. <laughs> So maybe I'm not that stupid. Um, and uh, yes, indeed, that's, that's already a paradoxical concept. Another one is, have you ever laughed to a blonde joke? Who has? <laughs> oh, not that many. I have. I'm ashamed of it, but I have. Yeah, okay, so that's another question here because these derogatory jokes in, uh, exist in every country. So every country could be also about allegedly stupid foreigners, so Belgian jokes. I mean, we have that in France. But in the case of blonde jokes, it's 
half of the population, right? It's not only blondes, it's also just women. And this joke seems to be important in the tradition. Uh, uh, it seems to be important to mock other stupidity in an essentializing manner. So all the Belgians or all the blondes, what does that mean also? It's another question. Um, it's, it looks like a, a benign ritual of scapegoating. Um, it's already pretty stupid because, of course, not all the Belgians are stupid or not all the blondes are stupid. It seems like also like an unhealthy indulgence and it functions also as an awkward social glue. Uh, so we just laugh together. It's, these jokes are just quite lightheaded. Everybody is allowed enough distance to find them funny without feeling that anyone is seriously insulted. Uh, so it's, it's like an innocuous version of war. Uh, and I think it's nice to think about it in this way. Um, but what do we mean when, when we say that uh, someone or somebody is stupid or something is stupid? I just want to start with a quick definition. Of course, I'm going to work on that during the whole presentation. But uh, there is one thing that I think is important to highlight is that we, we mean more than um, making a mistake. There are stupid mistakes. So you can make a mistake and nobody will see it as necessarily stupid. So a stupid mistake is a, is a mistake that could have easily been avoided. So obviously... It was, it was easy to do better. Um, it also means more than making an incorrect statement. So uh, actually someone can utter platitudes, but correct platitudes during the entire day. And this person will never say anything false, but she might or he might be called stupid. And uh, it also means that it's also related more than being ignorant. Um, it's not sufficient to be ignorant to be called stupid. You can always learn more. Being stupid is a bit more than that. Here I'm thinking, I want to refer to, I don't know if you, are, if you know this, this book by Flaubert, Gustave Flaubert, French uh, uh, writer, 19th century. Uh, Bouvard et Pécuchet is a story about two, uh, these two characters who are obsessed with science. So they read a lot, they read all the books, and uh, they, they learn everything by heart. They know a lot of things, huh? all these, their, their knowledge is not, uh, is, not, is not wrong. But Flaubert always insists or finds a way of suggesting that they are somehow stupid. Because they don't really understand what they learn. So that's one of the reasons. Also, they are very bad at applying their scientific knowledge. So they just always cause all sorts of catastrophes. And um, their lack of judgment also makes them incapable of creating knowledge uh, themselves. So that's also the reason why Flaubert suggests that they are stupid. So they are actually, they know a lot, but they are still, in France at least, they definitely are regarded as like kind of the uh, uh, archetype of stupidity. So I will, I will just propose this working definition of stupidity. Uh, an individual is said to be stupid or to act stupidly when one considers that uh, this, where is a typo, of course, that was important to have one in, in a stupidity conference, a uh, person made a mistake or chose a behavior which brought about particularly poor, ridiculously limited or detrimental, especially for this person, detrimental consequences, while it would have been easy to avoid such a misstep. But actually, this judgment uh, is always a bit tricky, is always a bit dangerous. It can be misleading, as I was saying, when you call someone else stupid, there is always this kind of concern that maybe what you are calling stupid is some form of genius and that it was entirely lost on you. <laughs> so in this case, you are the one stupid. And so there is always this risk when you call someone stupid that you are actually on the wrong, wrong side of the, <laughs> of the, the fence. Um, it can always backfire. Uh, there is always indeed this possibility that the judgment itself is regarded as stupid, also because the word stupid is not the most refined uh, concept ever. Uh, it's definitely an insult. Um, and uh, every reference to stupidity involves a deep concern regarding the general possibility of in human intelligence, actually. So there is actually it's something that is quite, uh, uh, quite serious somehow. 
So let's get to my questions. Are we all getting dumber? Uh, the reason why I think this question can be at least uh, yeah, posed is that in 2004, the news broke that apparently uh, the, after rapid rises in intelligence quotient, we may have hit a turning point. Um, so the rise of this in, uh, intelligence quotient is what is called the Flynn effect. Uh, the Flynn effect was uh, documented and named, documented by and named after James Flynn, an intelligence researcher that exists, so that's interesting. Uh, and um, it was an effect that was observed in both uh, developed and developing countries during the 20th century, and it was indeed quite a significant uh, rise at a rate of about three IQ points per decade. But, uh, indeed, something went wrong, apparently. Several studies report uh, a significant and continuous drop in IQ scores. Uh, first, among Norwegian male conscript, uh, conscripts tested from the mid-50s to 2002. So that's what you see on the curve here. The curve speaks for itself. In, uh, uh, it's, it's indeed a kind of a reversal, which was concerning for the researcher. And um, in the following years, a similar trend was reported among British, British sorry, teenagers in 2009, and in many countries, such as Finland, the Netherlands, and France, to name but a few. So the new debate started to develop. That might be a rampant worldwide phenomenon that started years ago, and I quote here Dutton in, uh, uh, is also an intelligence researcher, and he started to analyze the, the situation. And he said these results seem to indicate that approximately a century ago, a decline in the latent factor of genuine intelligence began, which until now has largely been cloaked by an increase in scores on IQ tests. I chose this quotation because I find it particularly confusing. Um, <laughs> so now we cannot really trust IQ tests. So definitely the, the crisis is, is quite strong. It definitely, I think there is a state of confusion here that is so, uh, so significant that it leads psychometrists to question the ability of IQ tests to reflect entirely faithfully the level of what they call G, general intelligence. And the state of confusion uh, reaches unseen levels also because not so long ago, and so uh, again, the, the first article about the Norwegian conscripts was published in 2004. This article was published in 2012, and it was to celebrate the publication of uh, Flynn's latest book, Are We Getting Smarter? And Flynn was advocating a positive answer, and so the, uh, the, the journalist in Folger, in Scientific American, uh, uh, using the result of uh, uh, Flynn's uh, studies, argued more advanced minds create, um, tech create technologies that in turn enhance intelligence. Further, uh, still, still further, forging a feedback loop that shows no sign of abatement, of abating, sorry. So the debate is quite confused, but it's also because actually IQ tests should be taken with this significant pinch of salt. Uh, that's definitely part of the problem. <laughs> so IQ tests, uh, I'm, I'm just going to summarize roughly, but I'm, I'm here delving on this uh, book that uh, does a wonderful job in deconstructing IQ tests. If, you, if you're interested in the topic, it's a, it's a very good reading. There are significant, se several significant limitations of IQ tests. I will just mention two of them. The first one is that they are designed uh, for, uh, to exacerbate differences. So uh, IQ tests uh, are first and foremost created to differentiate, not to measure intelligence per se, but to rank and for social management purposes. And to obtain su such a thing as a bell curve. And that's the goal somehow, namely a majority of normally gifted persons. So that's the, that's the big part of the bell. And a minority of particularly low scoring people and a minority of particularly high scoring people. This is useful 
in, uh, again, social management. But as a result, a good test is a test that exacerbates differences that without the test would be much more modest. It's also something that is, I think, quite uh, rarely emphasized. So it is designed specifically to work as a magnifier. There is another uh, aspect here is what is G. So IQ tests refer to uh, intelligence. That's, that's definitely what, what they claim to do, to measure intelligence. And they have been criticized because of that, because precisely they refer to general intelligence, so G, as the person's capacity for complex mental work and the underlying reality that is allegedly at work when someone takes an IQ test and is thus measured by the IQ test. Uh, so the IQ test somehow works as a thermometer, uh, but there is, a, there is actually a crucial difference with thermometers. There is a well understood causal connection between the volume of mercury or alcohol in a thermometer and temperature patterns. It's not the same for intelligence, actually, though these psychometrists always start from a fundamental assertion that was uh, made explicit by uh, one of them, Arthur Jensen. Um, intelligence is what intelligence tests measure. Okay, so good. Uh, IQ tests measure intelligence. Fine. What is intelligence? Intelligence is what IQ tests measure. <laughs> It's a circle. So the nature of this mysterious entity remains pretty debated. It's, it, it is something that is discussed in the field, but it's not something that is already defined. Uh, is it a fixed capacity? Is it genetically inherited? Is it environment induced? Uh, what is the role of memory, creativity, language, education, emotions, self-confidence, trauma, social exclusion in intelligence. In the field of psycho psychometrics, these are, let's say, issues that are addressed secondarily. They are not even remotely solved before IQ tests are created. So that's also a problem. And some indeed uh, very confusing press op-heads or interviews in which psychometrists such as Flynn um, say more, and it's not the only one, more than the fact would actually allow them to say, from speculations about technology that makes us smarter, but then, of course, in more recent articles, you will find that it makes us actually dumber, uh, to even more problematic nonchalant discussions on how immigration actually could be responsible for the reversal of the Flynn effect, or why black people in the US have lower scores in, at IQ tests. And here, that's really the horror gallery. Uh, and these discussions would be, well, first, would be much more cautious and much less heated if it were ma made clear to everyone in the first place that the very basis of the debate are highly hypothetical and methodically extremely fragile. IQ tests say nothing clear or scientifically factual about the nature of intelligence and its causes. So that's, that's, the, first, that's the first step. Um, yeah, okay, that was too fast. <laughs> Uh, but maybe we are indeed getting Denver, and it would mean can mean lots of things. Actually, it could mean that maybe it's just another form of intelligence that is developing, uh, a form that is not measured by IQ tests. Um, an important factor may also be that people got more skeptical about tests, and rightly so, or less confident uh, in the alleged increase of human intelligence during the past century in the light of the climate crisis. What were we thinking? Or debates about major discrimination patterns in our societies. So some kind of skepticism could have also formed regarding human intelligence because of these uh, aspects of, of contemporary uh, life. And actually, it's older than that. And that's when I move to the next slide. The issue of stupidity came at the center of postmodern philosophies. Uh, and that's, that's definitely something that started uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th. And it was in connection with what is famously called the crisis of modernity. Uh, it's a moment when thinkers, and more broadly people, entered a phase of huge doubts regarding human alleged brilliant capacities. And 
to be sure, so I mentioned indeed Nietzsche, uh, so Nietzsche is always referring to the stupidity of his contemporaries. Uh, Musil is a good example. He gave a lecture entitled On Stupidity. Uh, it's a beautiful book, and uh, Arendt is also referring, but uh, of course we can discuss that later, but uh, she's referring but very cautiously to the possible stupidity, kind of stupidity, awkward stupidity of Eichmann. Um, but it's not, again, it's not new. <laughs> of course, we can just go back uh, uh, to Erasmus. Uh, it's, of course, a key reference when you talk about stupidity. In this book, uh, so in Praise of Folly, Stultitie, uh, Laos, so it's really stupidity in Latin. I think it's also, folly is a good translation, but it's also stupidity. So in this book, Erasmus at the same time mocks the stupid behavior of men, especially his contemporaries, who are obsessed with silly things, they are pedantic, uh, they think they know while they don't, they are easily deceived by flattery, social gratification, and so on and so forth. And he actually seriously advocates the idea that it's absurd to try to overcome one's stupidity. Uh, without stupidity, Erasmus uh, argues, we would never undertake anything. We need this little dimension of stupidity to, uh, to undertake our enterprises. If we really wanted first to reach a perfect knowledge of the results of our future actions before making the decision to achieve these actions, we would never do anything. And of course, there is a theological dimension to the text. Christ was regarded as a fool by many of his contemporaries. There is also this importance of simplicity, humility, embracing human finitude, human failures in the scripture. But... Actually, there is a big difference between Erasmus and the authors and I mentioned before, so Nietzsche, Arendt, I mean, the postmodern philosophers. The crisis is much more serious in their case. Actually, when you read Erasmus, there is still some kind of optimism in the text. Um, what, what, uh, what makes a big difference between, between uh, Erasmus and these authors is that the the text of Erasmus still comes across as a praise for common sense or reason in the sense of the ability to be reasonable, to be aware of its limitations and so on. But after the crisis of modernity, common sense is not regarded as, good enough, as a good enough response any longer. After centuries of electrifying developments of the modern reasonable man, the fall is harder, harder than ever. And there are many reasons for that. Yes, Darwin, of course, this possible connection between humans and animals. When you call someone stupid, quite often there is a comparison with animals. And of course, Darwinism uh, definitely affected this image of the brilliant, exceptional human, uh, human beings. That's part of it. But also the development of mass uh, culture and an often shallow and conventional relation to cultural project, projects or products, sorry. So what is trendy, what is chic? Uh, and later, the first, after, that's of course another aspect, the first and second world war against which the development of science could nothing. The development of bureaucracy as well, I was mentioning Eichmann uh, before, beforehand, people just blindly implementing orders coming from above and who lose their sense of responsibility. All these demonstrate that the order of reason, uh, this order of human intelligence in Western culture is extremely fragile. And we may be actually going through a renewed version of this existential crisis. Um, it takes several forms, I think, but there is one aspect uh, to it that I want to emphasize. Is that here the idea is somehow stupidity could be a social structure. And indeed, recently, uh, whistleblowers confirmed, blowers, sorry, confirmed that many experts and researchers already, what many researchers were already suspecting, somehow social media uh, make us dumber. Um, yes, so that's also uh, another reference. As it turns out, the algorithms in many social media tend to facilitate hate speech and foster simplistic and antagonizing content. They are clickbait, they generate flow, even more problematic, they increase polarization uh, in society and very quickly general, generate 
parallel reality. So through the social network, when Facebook or Twitter are in charge of our news feed, well, we are fed information that confirm our biases, and yet we tend to forget that the content is personalized. Hence the growing situation of misunderstanding between various groups in the society, and it's something that is emphasized by uh, Justin Rosenstein in The Social Dilemma. We are simply operating on a different set of facts. You start to think, but how can these people be so stupid? And I think we ask this question quite often also nowadays. And so indeed, these parallel reality, realities is definitely part of the problem. Plus, social media and their unpredictable content are also addictive. It's like a Christmas cracker or slot machines in casino. You just refresh the page with excitement and curiosity. There is something, always something new popping up. It's hypnotic and it's free. So that's uh, also, uh, of course, uh, what makes it more addictive. And here we can recognize several characters of what is, let's say, usually referred to um, in the vocabulary uh, of stupidity or the vocabulary designating stupidity. So the first one is idios. So it comes, it's a, it's a Greek word and it means private one's own. So that's the root of idiot. So idios here, I think, highlights something important about stupidity or what we call stupidity, namely that stupidity is a form of withdrawal. It's first, it's a form of isolation or isolated state in a, in a, in a society, someone who doesn't think like others, but also a withdrawal into oneself, the inability to take part in a diverse society, the inability to acknowledge anything that is foreign, alien, different from oneself. Um, so that's one of the aspects. The second is simplicity or simple. It's also an important uh, aspect of the all the all the uh, uh, all the vocabulary terminology referring to stupidity. So you can think of simply in in, in French, simple-minded. So simplicity, excessive simplicity, is also a part of what we call stupidity. Um, and so. Indeed, our, also our intention spans are, are shrinking. That's also another aspect. Another interesting root is de, <laughs> so which, was, which is the root for all these words like dumb, dumb, <laughs> in different, dumb, in different languages. So it means actually to whirl, to blow, to obscure, vapor, smoke. It's about confusion. And so indeed, there is always an aspect of confusion in, in, in stupidity. In the case I was mentioning beforehand, so the, the, our situation nowadays, it is definitely confusing for us to see that indeed some people can be so stupid. I think, uh, at least that's what we think. How can they be so stupid? There is something confusing about it. But also confusing to see how volatile the situation is on the, on the basis of so many misunderstandings. So you can think of the capital events also in the, in the US. And being thrown in a system that is essentially manipulative generates confusion. Uh, in, uh, there, there is also another uh, reference that I also find illuminating. So it's also the reference to folly. Um, so folly in, in Latin also means to move randomly, to roam about, to swirl. So we also have like some connections with the. <laughs> Um, but also, yeah, indeed, that a fool is, is, uh, is uh, uh, an important aspect to it. So there is also this dimension of inconsistency and uh, lightheadedness. Um, and another one is selic. So it's also a, an Anglo-Saxon uh, root, and it means happy. And indeed, stupidity is also this ability not to, well, this an, an ability to find a good solution in a complex situation, but also it's also being very happy about it, feeling that, I mean, this poor reaction is perfectly sufficient. So that's, that's another aspect to stupidity. So there are actually, oh yes, and also stupere, so like to be entirely stunned, immobile. And that's also, I think, part of what I have described because the social media can also turn us into puppets or zombies walking mechanically in directions that change depending on the algorithms. So that's also part of this being stunned or being becoming stupid in a, in a very literal sense. So there are different... Uh, forms of stupidity or different aspects to it. The first is that it can be an external phenomenon, actually, a stupid structure. That's an important aspect of stupidity. So it, it means that the, the, the social structures just make people incapable of understanding each other. And I think what I have described is really uh, what, what, what is at stake here. Um, stupid is an, is, is an insult that flourishes when people stop understanding each other and lapse into a radical conflict. 
people are not necessarily stupid in themselves, but the social structure generates a situation of increasing, all-pervading stupidity. You can also think of the, the debates about structure of dis discrimination in the past years. They have also eroded the idea of human intelligence. I was mentioning the blonde jokes. Some of our traditions, some, some turns of phrase are racist or sexist, but we had no idea. And so, or almost no idea. So people may mean no harm, and yet they can be violently accused by those who are tired uh, of being a laughing stock. And this is confusing for everyone because in a structure, in a racist or sexist structure, we are both guilty and largely blind. That's why even women can tell blonde jokes. It's, it's a possibility. We should certainly have known better and we realize that we should have known better. That's also why it's stupid in the sense that we realize that, well, how could we be so blind? Uh, but it's also hidden and insidious and that's also something that again erodes this confidence in, in human intelligence. But it's something that is pretty, that is, I, I think that really develops at the level of a social structure. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot that. So, but it's also possible to mean to refer to stupidity in the sense of intrinsic stupidity. Stupidity at the very quality of the person. It could be occasional, this behavior of his is stupid, or more seriously, permanent, he is stupid. <laughs> so sometimes that's what we mean. Um, but I, I, I think it's also important to, to uh, emphasize that all the forms of stupidity boil down to a strong concern regarding the last one. Um, even the first anonymous stupidity implies that human's intelligence and ability to think depends heavily on the help of some tools and various material auxiliaries or crutches like machines, but also a certain social context, which is also very reflective of the intrinsic weakness and situatedness of our intelligence. But to move to a more positive <laughs> approach to stupidity, I would like to refer to two philosophers uh, who I think help us address this issue again in a more optimistic manner, in a more radical manner, and I think in a more constructive manner. And the first one is Sartre. Sartre is probably the one who addressed the, the issue of stupidity in the most radical way, just by saying that stupidity doesn't exist. End of story. Uh, there are no fools, just wicked men. What does that mean? According to Sartre, the judgment X is stupid does not denote the stupidity of X. It connotes, because it's not what was intended in the first place, the wickedness of the person who utters this judgment. And that's it. So for Sartre, that's pretty radical, I will try to explain, but that's extremely radical. So it's a radical destruction of stupidity in Sartre's philosophy, which I think is quite healthy uh, to a certain extent, maybe overly optimistic, but it is one of two things. That's the argument of Sartre. Um, so the judgment X is stupid is either literal. So you absolutely mean it literally. In this case, uh, you are really claiming that this person is stupid like uh, in a literal manner, so it's a person that is irresponsible. So there is a problem with this uh, way of it. That's why Saad says it's actually impossible. It doesn't really work. If you really mean it literally, first, it's very dehumanizing. So do we really want to say that when we call someone stupid? It's actually more violent than we sometimes mean it. And so that's also why sometimes we just say, but are you stupid? <laughs> That's a little less violent than you are stupid, period. Um, so it's very dehumanizing. And according to Sartre, it's actually improvable. How can you demonstrate that someone is indeed literally uh, and forever unable to learn? And so that's, uh, if you really mean it in, the, in a completely literal sense, you mean that this person is indeed somehow mute, stuck in this stupor, cannot really learn. Uh, this, it's, it's stuck with pre-wired instinctive reactions like beasts and irremediably confused. So first, it's very rarely what we mean because it's pretty, it's indeed extremely wicked. And second, it's impossible to demonstrate. To demonstrate no human subject should ever be reduced to any alleged fixed properties. And here you probably recognize that. Essentialization, intelligence and knowledge are dynamical. They are open-ended processes. I can always discover more. I can change my perspective. I am never irremediably ignorant. And in any case, I cannot really demonstrate that for sure one person is irremediably ignorant. Or it's just a metaphor. 
it's a possibility. Most of the time, it's some kind of a metaphor. But then the accusation is uh, indeed uh, still still there, and this chosen uh, turn of phrase is maybe not the, the most appropriate because. If you think that someone is ignorant or missed something that could have been easily done better or thought better, it's still possible to explain. But when you say you're stupid, <laughs> you're not really explaining, you are somehow ending the dialogue or making it almost impossible because you are also insulting this person. So it's almost, it's, it's actually even, even more uh, problematic than that because it can also work as a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh, because indeed that's the end of the dialogue. So if you say someone is stupid, you won't really help this person. And that's precisely the problem. That's what creates the, the, the stupid structure, then it's, it becomes indeed something like people insulting each other in a stupid structure. And so that, that's really, according to Saad, that is what creates the problem, not the cause of the problem. Um, and um, yeah, and, and say, okay, maybe it's too fast. Um, so the judgment itself is indeed uh, wicked. That's the idea of, of Sartre. It's, it's ill, it's definitely ill meaning. And that's, that's also what leads Sartre to a second step. Stupidity exists because of judgments of stupidity. And more than that, it can take the face of stable and objective realities only through established structures of oppression. There must be ways of giving substance, reality to something that actually does not exist. So according to Sartre, stupidity doesn't exist. So when we feel that we are justified in calling someone stupid, it's probably because we are supported by a social structure. People who are just very commonly called stupid. And so then there is indeed this reference to, of Sartre to people who become the official idiot. And Flaubert is a good example because it's also something that you may not know, but Flaubert, great author, was actually regarded as uh, the idiot of the family by all his relatives. Also when he was an adult, he was all of them just write letters that's really pity him for being so stupid. <laughs> and so, of course, that's interesting for Sartre to emphasize uh, the, the, this, this discrepancy between what we know of Flaubert, great author, author, someone who is usually regarded as a genius, and still someone who was regarded as stupid by his family. I'm not going to delve into the detail. I see that I still don't have much time left. Um, but I think it's important for Sartre to use this example to show how the way a, a children is uh, uh, somehow uh, accepted by his parents, because that's all the, the, the book is about, um, can modify the intelligence of this, of this person. So Flaubert never had the intelligence of his father, a doctor. He was also the second son, so he was not particularly welcome. The first son was already there. He was named after the father. Gustave was like a very, very bad surprise. The mother was, was really uh, expecting a girl. So it was a disappointment from the beginning. And he was never raised with a lot of uh, uh, positive uh, 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 affects, definitely. And so what is also interesting for, for Sartre is that, oh, that's too fast, is also that um, Flaubert obviously overcame this, uh, this uh, accusation of stupidity, he just found ways of developing alternative uh, intelligence, definitely not the analytical intelligence uh, that his father valued, but another intelligence. And so, of course, that is Sartre's case. Uh, so uh, that is the perfect case for Sartre's theory, namely stupidity is maybe something that the society tried to pin on you, but it's actually not a real thing. Um, but again, uh, Deleuze, and I will finish with that, Deleuze's approach, uh, so yeah, sorry, Sartre's approach to stupidity may be overly enthusiastic or overly optimistic. Because to be sure, uh, um, yes, the idea of Sartre is that intelligent people create stupid people. That's more or less the idea. And stupid people, alleged stupid people, just embrace something that's a judgment that was uh, that was uh, ascribed to them by by others. But still, a mystery in this in this approach is why intelligent people need scapegoats uh, to reassure themselves. And if they need that, are they that intelligent? So if we really need still all these jokes, and sometimes it's a little bit stupid indeed, does that mean that we are that intelligent and that we can get rid of stupidity that easily? And I finish with Deleuze. 
because Deleuze's approach to stupidity positions itself uh, a little bit uh, differently uh, if you compare it to Sartre. Um, Deleuze doesn't think that stupidity doesn't exist, um, but he definitely thinks that we can do something quite nice with it. And so Deleuze consistently um, uh, refers here to, to, to Descartes to begin with. There, there is a big difference between what Deleuze claims and what Descartes claims regarding stupidity. In Descartes, there is not a stupidity problem at all. There is a text about mistakes, and the idea of Descartes is that we can make mistakes only if we do not, do not apply the right methods. So if you just apply the right method, you will be always uh, safe, no mistakes. And, uh, and thus, no, no stupidity. You see that in, in Descartes' meditation. Uh, Descartes says, yes, our understanding is limited. Uh, but it doesn't mean that God created us in a faulty way. That would be problematic. Uh, we, we, it defines intelligence in the way we use our capacities together. So our understand, understanding is limited, but our will is unlimited. So when we don't know or when, we, or when it's unclear, we always have the possibility to decide, that's the will, that we'll, we won't judge anything. We will just, you know, bracket our, our decisions. And yes, it's not clear, but on the, on the other hand, we are not making a mistake because we are not saying anything. Um, and the idea of, of Deleuze here, and definitely Deleuze is unconvinced by this argument, is that Descartes is writing with an agenda. It gives voice to the classical faith in a fundamentally good nature of thought, uh, guaranteed by God. And moreover, Deleuze highlights Descartes as a quite stupid way of solving the issue of human vulnerability to error. Uh, why stupid? So, okay, it was um, going a bit faster. Descartes' take on stupidity is stupid according to Deleuze, stupid in the sense of simplistic. When confronted with a complex situation, it's always possible to schematize it. Descartes does that all the time, to develop a clarifying account on it and to break it up into a few simple elements so that we can quickly get on top of it. Denial <laughs> can definitely be a good solution, but sooner or later, the issue will return. Descartes, and in this regard, is a good representative of modern times and the model of analytical intelligence uh, upon which our civilization was built, always prioritizes clarity and simplicity. He reduces everything to the most simple and parsimonious set of hypotheses. That's also what is known as the Occam's razor. This attitude is adequate when the priority is to explain away complex issues and remain what Descartes called the master and possessor of nature. Yet clarity is not an absolute value, especially when reality is actually intrinsically complex. And that's Exactly, Deleuze's point. So, for instance, I'm just summarizing roughly, but Descartes argued that my body is quite opaque. I don't really know what's happening in my body. It's me and it's not me. And so Descartes says, cut to the chase. <laughs> Let's say that our bodies should be understood as mere machines and we, we, will, we will be able to repair them without putting too much sentiment into the process. That's effective. It worked to a certain extent. It's definitely also a simplification. Uh, it's fair to say that Descartes is always eager to clarify, and clear becomes the ultimate criterion, as is often the case nowadays, clear, sharp, effective, uh, and a quest for confirmation, recognition, readability. It's not what Deleuze is interested in. None of our theoretical systems have ever brought us on top of a situation of, a situation of fully mastering and understanding the complexity of reality. Deleuze argues that the arrogant ambition of reducing things to what we can understand has actually led our civilization to often, consistently, uh, overlook complexity, the complexity of reality. Um, for instance, and most of the medications were based on male-only clinical trials. Women were excluded, first allegedly to protect them. Makes sense to a certain extent. But the result is that the medications are not adapted. So it's a little bit of a stupid process because to protect them, we are actually making them sicker, and it's, it's a fact that the, the, the rate of, uh, of side effects for women is significantly, significantly higher. Even more so, I mean, uh, what, what happened when this bias was, was uh, unearthed, the, the, the unbalance continued because first, there was a lack of physiological data. Previous studies had used only men, so as to obtain comparable data, it's better to continue with men. Yeah, 
it's an argument, and the complexity and variability of the response to medications is also a problem, uh, depending on different hormonal states during uh, the cycle and, or, or, and also hormonal contraception. So, of course, there is sexism here, but also, I think, obviously, a difficulty to deal with differences and the limit also to deal with the limits of highly standardized procedures, which also made the success of science, but, of course, it's, it does reach uh, some, some limits. And Deleuze therefore contends that stupidity is actually an intrinsic aspect of human, the human condition. We cannot avoid it. There are always moments when stupidity, what Deleuze describes as this viscous, unarticulated, horrid magma, overwhelms us. These shocks disturb us. All our faculties were not really able to think clearly. But it's also the sign that we are forced outside of our reassuring patterns of thought by a complex reality. So if, according to, to Deleuze, it's actually good news. Deleuze is not completely pessimistic, pessimistic, quite the opposite, although his definition of intelligence differs radically from Descartes. I think you can define it as profundity. It's the key word here. Deleuze values and, and uh, this, this profundity as a way of overcoming stupidity in, in a discourse or in figures that are not pure chaos, but that does, that, it's when we try somehow to maybe understand this situation and conceptualize it, but in a way that will never um, entirely um, uh, suppress the dimension of complexity. And so it's just uh, a few examples, so the examples that Deleuze gives when he refers to a good way of overcoming stupidity. Kafka, Artaud, um, Redon, all these authors or creators or the thinkers who always introduce a dimension of chaos in their work. So it's not, I'm sorry, it's, of course, you can, when you read Kafka, you also have this impression that you are dealing with very stupid stories sometimes, uh, but it's also not stupid. It's actually extremely profound, but you, got, you don't find solutions. You won't find something very Cartesian in Kafka, for instance. And Deleuze indeed thinks that it's also the way we can somehow embrace our stupidity. So that was my, my indeed my point here. I think we can embrace our own stupidity. That's also what uh, Deleuze said. That was the, a quotation that I presented earlier. So stupidity is never someone, someone else's stupidity. It should be mine first. It's a way of dealing with this tendency that we have to call others stupid because it's reassuring, but it's all, always an insult and it's always a projection and it always backfires. So it's better to start with dealing with our own <laughs> problems somehow. Also because stupidity is not irreparable. Uh, so it's just a part of, uh, it's, it's a condition of thought according to Deleuze. A good way of thinking is a way of thinking that will go through stupidity and embrace it in this sense. It's a way of confronting uh, with uh, uh, the complexity of reality. It can function as a fruitful challenge to explore the reality in further details. It's actually a good way just to move towards more subtlety, towards something that is indeed more profound. And that's the idea of, of Deleuze. And I do think that here uh, we have definitely something like a solution, uh, or at least like a working uh, proposal for a solution. Um, um, there, if you read Deleuze, you will find also a lot of wicked accusations <laughs> of stupidity. Deleuze is not necessarily kind with his contemporaries. So here I would combine Sartre with, uh, with Deleuze a little bit uh, to also just bring this, this tolerance and this uh, uh, somehow this reference to a more a kinder way of dealing with stupidity that you find in Sartre. Uh, but yeah, at the end of the day, realizing that stupidity is not per se an insurmountable failure, but rather an in intrinsic part of our journey towards more, more profundity is, and more tolerance is also some, somewhat, I would say, impelling and fortifying. I thank you. Merci. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you a lot for this uh, very fruitful lecture in which we, um, you explored many, many different aspects. Um, um, my first question is probably, um, you, you, I, I have the impression that the, the definition that you uh, proposed of stupidity uh, sort of changed during the lecture. So we have different elements, different constellations in which stupidity function. I would like to explore these a little bit further. Mm -hmm. So the first one is uh, the relation between 
stupidity and these intelligence tests that you uh, mentioned. So the fact that we measure intelligence, what is it we measure? Yeah, that what we measure, in, in, in intelligence. And then these slogans that we're getting, dumber, but is dumb the same as stupidity? Because if I have to believe your definition, uh, this dumbness uh, that 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 is allegedly spreading is something else than stupidity. Stupidity is so much more than just dumbness. So what is what is the exact relation between these intelligence tests and and what we measure or not measure um, in terms of of stupidity? What is the relation with stupidity? I didn't quite yeah. follow. No, sure. Um, no, thank you. Uh, intelligent tests. Uh, Basically, it's it's a school achievement test. Uh, it's uh, at the end of the day. Of course, there are elements in the test that are not necessarily immediately targeting things that you learn at school, but the very format of it is very close to what people learn at school. So it also an explanation for the Flynn effect to a certain extent. Um, so that's it's it's very analytical. It definitely measures a certain aspect of intelligence, but definitely not taking into account the way, for instance, I was saying, emotions, traumas, social exclusion can also be part of the picture and th so that's that's the way I would I would uh, uh, define what is measured by IQ tests what what is called dumb well I, th I think I mean also what I wanted to suggest is that we use a lot of words and they are all very approximate <laughs> yeah. because we are not really fully encompassing what we are talking about um, so dumb I think if you just refer also to the the root it's also like about I, I mean also like the or not uh, the, just the Sound Duh. Duh. Yeah, yeah. is also very much about somehow. I mean, I mean, I'm, I am not wrapping my mind around that. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's really, and that's really, I am not making a concept there. Yeah. I'm just using like so, something that is very basic. Like also when Greeks were calling people not speaking their language bar barbarians. I mean, that's also barbarians. Yeah. They are not talking something understandable. So there is also something like very much about this. First, something that you recognize or you don't recognize in others, that's weird. But also something that you can, that's also the loser's point, something that you can experience yourself. Like these moments of confusion, these moments when you don't get it. Mm -hmm. and that's awful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just can try to put some names on it. But most of them are, are still bearing the mark of the confusion that was the source of all this. Mm -hmm. So all these terms, that's also interesting to know that there are different terms. Because all of them show that we really don't have a concept of stupidity. Yeah, but you have working definitions. Would, it was a working definition, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, but my working definition was about what we mean when we say something. That, okay. uh, then it was more, because I, if I had to define stupidity, I would definitely define it as a part of our condition, but definitely not instrumentable. And that's connected to this confusion that uh, overwhelms us from time to time when faced with the complexity of, of existence. And then the second step is I can't, endure that, it's easier to say this person is stupid mm -hmm. and it's not on me anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so and does it also mean, so if I understand you correctly, does this also mean that we can be intelligent on one, uh, yeah. on the scale of the IQ test sure. and at the same time be extremely stupid? Exactly. That, that, that is what you mean. Yes. Uh, could you give an example of that? <laughs> <laughs> not me. <laughs> 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 no, but I mean, all of us, right? Yeah. Uh, I think we, I mean, we all experience that. I think these moments, these moments, because we are all, I think, well educated, right? I mean, so, and we sometimes we are able, to, we, if, you, if you just ask me to explain in detail what the concepts of Heidegger's philosophy are, I can do that. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that I don't have the huge moment of stupidity. And so, and even with Heidegger sometimes, but also just in everyday life. So yes, I do think, because, because reality is something that cannot be addressed also, uh, or not only exclusively through a good education. If you think it suffice, then you already have a problem. So it's, it's just reality reminding you that <laughs> it's more, there's more. And the solutions that the society offers you may actually work from time to time, but not always. So that's an example I, I don't want to give. <laughs> I, I think we can also all experience that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's uh, just also this. Then it's more that something that we should look. Uh, could, could it be? Well, referring to myself, then 
Uh, could it be that, you know, I've been lecturing about, uh, well, I don't lecture a lot about Heidegger, but I, I've been lecturing about a complex philosopher, and I've been explaining these thoughts, and it's all highly complex, and I feel myself to be reasonably intelligent while uh, doing it, and the, the students might f find that I'm reasonably intelligent. And then I come to the Vietze Stalling of uh, Erasmus <laughs> building and I sort of lost where I left my bike and I feel extremely yeah. stupid. Is, is that, is that what you mean? Yes, exactly, indeed, that's also what I mean. But also sometimes in, uh, you give a course and so the students, uh, students ask a question that is very down to earth about yeah. a philosopher and then all your technical words are not of use any longer. So you really have to explain, well, what, what does it mean really clearly and how is it gonna make me happier, for instance? Well, yeah. that's a good question, yeah. but it's a difficult one. And so indeed we can feel a bit dumb sometimes uh, when asked, but that's I think very healthy in this case. And so, why is it healthy? Because if you just say, oh, that's a stupid question, you just think that all your technical knowledge about this author, for instance, is sufficient. That you have reached in the, the climax of intelligence, that indeed uh, you, are, you are extremely very happy about what our society defines as intelligence. But it's actually an opportunity to learn more, because it's actually how does Heidegger make me happier, I think is mm -hmm. actually a very good mm -hmm. question, and I wouldn't have an answer right away, but I think that's... Uh, it's. So stupid can also mean being confronted with a whole different perspective uh, that is indeed disturbing, yeah. but it's interesting. I mean, it's sometimes painful, but interesting. Yeah, but I, I really have problems with that because that, that, that uh, we'll come to the Deleuze, but you had, to, you had to go a little bit faster. And, and I think uh, we have to sort of explore that a little bit more. Um, but so this, this positive stance towards, towards uh, uh, stupidity. I've, I have big problems with that because uh, I, I don't know about you, but um, uh, so I have a medical problem with my leg, which is why I have these strange uh, shoes. And then I'm confronted with the bureaucratic system of, uh, of Dutch healthcare. There's so many stupid people, There's so many <laughs> stupid bureaucratic things that you know you call them and they don't call you yeah. back and you do this and and so i have i have a real problem embracing at, at least someone else's yeah. stupidity yeah but you're I mean, talking <laughs> about your own stupidity <laughs> but someone else's stupidity well, i really feel bureaucracy is stupid and because we are we are all sometimes you know doing saying oh it's not my decision it's my superior's decision or it's just what i do when mm -hmm. you say that you are also someone else is stupid <laughs> yeah so because you're just you know relying and so um the, the, but the, the, the that was more my my uh, i don't think Deleuze address is that that much but i do think that the, the reference to stupidity as being also a structure is interesting it's also good because of course we can be part of it we can be, contribute to it we're yeah. not fully innocent obviously yeah. but it's also something that is bigger than us and that's the possibility of this to exist as a structure that makes stupidity real in this case because it's easier to say it's not on me it's you know it's my boss or it's the other service go to the other service. oh you should call this number that's another number <laughs> that's it's just all the ramification of the structure that creates stupidity even even for everyone so then of course it's also easier to say it's somebody else's stupid who is responsible for that mess but actually that's it's also all of us and none of us in a certain to a certain extent and that's also when you say oh this person i am talking to at the moment and uh, i don't know at the office or whatever yeah. it's stupid it's probably the wrong way to go about it because it's just the whole structure that is stupid mm -hmm. and but we are stuck in it that's mm -hmm. also the big problem. But here in this case, I think it's also for a philosopher, it's also good just to name it, just like it's a structure. And then it's also, Sartre would definitely be a good uh, uh, remedy here because he always refers us to yeah, our so, so I would have to read Sartre a bit more yeah. to get... In this case, yeah. I think yeah, Sartre I think is, so. is healthier in this case because you just say, you know, you create your monsters, so, so it's for your responsibility yeah. to, uh, to, to unfold them. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, I think it's... It's indeed quite, <laughs> it's also quite a reasonable way of dealing with that. It's complicated mm -hmm. indeed to, you know, deconstruct bureaucracy, but at least being aware that it's a structure and the, all this is making us kind of stupid mm -hmm. and then deal with enormously stupid situations is, is, is it's healthy. Yeah. And, 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 but again, so this is again, I have the impression a different, yeah. um, a different concept of uh, stupidity. And to, to make it really radical, you, you had this very brief uh, reference to Hannah Arendt's uh, 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 work on, on Eichmann, uh, which we now know is partially wrong. 
she, 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 she couldn't know, but we know now that Eichmann was much higher up mm-hmm. the hierarchy than she thought he was. He, he, she thought he was just this, this bureaucrat who, who, t- who took orders, but we now know he issued the orders. Mm-hmm. Um, but 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 the the concept of Arendt is I think here is still valid and very uh, interesting. So the fact that you're part of this machine, uh, this machine that has utterly and completely barbaric uh, uh, goals, and that you depend on this machine and you also blame the the, the, the system, you you avoid your own responsibility. But is that stupid or no. is that? I, I, so I, I very briefly mentioned it, yeah. but actually to be entirely fair, Arendt, so there, that's the quotation, it's in an, it's an inter- interview, she was hesitating, yeah. she was tempted to call that stupid, yeah. but in uh, other texts they actually say, no, it was not stupid, yeah. <laughs> of course, because then it's at the end of his responsibility. Yeah. So it's more stupidity, I think it's also about what we are dealing with, namely that we can indeed create monsters, uh, that these structures do create monsters, that we can also be sometimes the monster, but in the case of Eichmann it's also very important indeed to say that at the end of the day, of course, he was blaming it on others, which is like structural stupidity, but not in the sense that he's irresponsible, obviously. And so uh, to be entirely clear about what Aaron said, she, it's just a quotation, it's a bit misleading, because at the end of the day, she was hesitating, but she says, no, he was actually not stupid <laughs> for yeah. that reason, because it was fully responsible. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. So, th- th- so there we shouldn't uh, apply the concept of, of stupidity. No, I think I don't think so. I think then it's also it's it's um, it's too it's also very simplistic in this case. It's also it's, it misses the big picture, the fact that it's uh, the structure itself was indeed cr- the, the source of stupidity, but stupidity not never in the sense of fully responsibility. Yeah. Um, it's never in the sense of pure responsibility. That's yeah. also the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and let, let's then move to indeed to the the, the in which you 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 uh, you had to touch upon very very briefly, um, uh, and I couldn't quite follow. Oh, yeah. uh, so I um, so in his case, uh, what he, what he says that uh, stupidity. Uh, what, what what exactly does he mean by this by this quotation that you gave? It's never someone someone else's stupidity. What exactly is it, what, what he means so by that? He means that it's a, in an intrinsic dimension of thought, human thought, thought in general actually, not only human, thought. Uh, you cannot think without this dimension of stupidity. Uh, thought is always, so he calls it transcendental for that reason. He says actually for Descartes there is no problem of stupidity, but actually every thought integrates this dimension. So that's what he means that it's never somebody else's stupidity because it's actually the condition of just my very being as a thinking subject. So stupidity is always in me, it's always in my way of thinking. I can entirely just, you know, negate it, but it's there. And, and what does it mean? Does it mean ignorance? No, it means these, so the way he describes it, um, so it's, it's indeed pretty subtle, but the first the way of, it, of describing it is this experience of being um, overwhelmed by what it defines in terms of magma, horrid, viscous matter, indeterminate matter, monsters, something that is just like not clearly defined. So, um, and so he says uh, we do experience that sometimes. And in this case, we feel stupid. That's the first definition. But then there is a second one in Deleuze, which is if you um, dismiss this experience and to think as Descartes does. Descartes is, according to Deleuze, stupid very, in the. Very f- uh, yeah, exactly. Very stupid because he's happy, like <laughs> because he's happy with his solution. Mm-hmm. He's enthusiastic about his solution. Mm-hmm. For Deleuze, it's also someone being enthusiastic with the poor or simplistic solution. So stupidity takes place, according to Deleuze, at this at this very moment when you experience, you are overwhelmed by something that is indeed difficult to uh, encompass, difficult to, to reality, basically. And then here you have definitely two options. Either you just embrace it, somehow you embrace the difficulty, and according to Deleuze, then you have this reversal. It's what he calls, maybe not being smart, but definitely something that he admires, and it is not stupid in the sense of dumb. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and you have Descartes, that's I think a little bit unfair actually, mm-hmm. but Descartes, who is very happy with, okay, just like, let, let's define the body on the one hand, the soul on the other hand, we will never mix them together, and that's a good solution, hurrah. Yeah. <laughs> so that's definitely the problem according to, for Deleuze is pretty harsh about Descartes, and he 
says, of course, uh, it's a provocation, but it's all, I think yeah. he has a point. It's stupid. Yeah, and so and, and not being stupid, uh, w w would that be being smart? Would that be... Yeah, yeah. embrace it. Yeah. Just, okay, it's complex. So he gives the example of the Kafka. Yeah. It's a good example. So Kafka is obviously a good representative of this generation of people overwhelmed by the stupidity of the world, including theirs, and he's not particularly happy with himself, <laughs> that's uh, for sure. And you see that in the, in the book, but the book is still... It still has a form, a very fragile form, but you can read it. You, you still understand something, but not fully. Mm -hmm. It's not as clear as Descartes. But still, it, it still has a form, so you are not, it's not only about saying duh. Yeah. <laughs> Kafka is not only saying duh. He's, saying, he's already building something quite complex and yeah. interesting. Yeah. And so that's profound. So for Deleuze, it's definitely a good example yeah. of... So the, the opposite of stupidity would be pro pro profound. Profound would be, yeah. yeah. Which integrates this magma somehow, like it's always there. Yeah, yeah. And it would, and it would mean to entail, it would entail embracing complexity, right? And, and, and not finding simple uh, solutions yes. like Descartes, uh, like, uh, like Descartes yeah. did. And also yeah. just accepting this moment when everything is confused. Yeah. Because according to Deleuze, he calls that a problem, and he says that's the beginning of good thoughts. And if I accept the problem, if I don't dismiss it, then I start actually thinking. Yeah, yeah. So again, the, the, to, to come back to, to make the link between what you said earlier, Deleuze wouldn't be particularly impressed by these intelligence tests, would he? No. Yeah. <laughs> Of course not, because yeah. uh, because they are simplistic. They are also yeah. an, an attempt to get on top of things, like yeah. uh, as quickly as effectively as possible. Yeah. So yes, and and Sartre is not either, yeah. obviously. And, and and this is what you I, I mean you 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 in passing you uh, a couple of times you refer to analytical intelligence. Is this is 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 this part, is this what you mean by? Yeah. And, you know, you have this uh, analytical in a very broad sense, in this in the sense of you just break the, uh, break up. Uh, a complex reality in, into small parts. Descartes does that actually yeah. quite a lot. Yeah. And, and then you're just happy with all this because they are clearer, they are well circumscribed, and that's good enough. And synthetical approach is more about taking the big picture, accepting that everything is intricate, that is intertwined, and just having the little parts is not going to be enough to solve or to understand the situation. So mm -hmm. you can, it can help to a certain extent, but it's not enough. Yeah. That's what I had in mind. A, 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 a di different perspective. Another question. While you were giving this lecture, I was thinking of this infamous or famous quote by Whitehead that, you know, Western philosophy is a series of footnotes to Plato. Um, and I was actually thinking of, of, uh, of, of the figure of Socrates, who, who actually says of himself, not that he's stupid, but that he, he doesn't know, that he's ignorant. Uh, but that there's one thing at least that he knows is that he doesn't know uh, this kind of ignorance and this kind of ignorance which is which Plato says is, is bliss because it's the, the beginning of all philosophy that the realization that there's so much that you don't know how does that relate to stupidity is there a relation with your with the concept of yeah, stupidity yeah. as you as you have elaborated it or, or I would I would different? I would definitely create a link I mean I've, I um, that's all uh, philosophy uh, I, I, I think is very well represented in the, the, the Plato's dialogues also because it's not only about clarity yeah. <laughs> it's also about uh, there is some some ways of just embracing the confusion sometimes. That's just when you read Plato's dialogues, sometimes, you know, aporetic dialogues, it's also about not giving a solution. Yeah. And so, uh, and being actually thinking that's actually the heart of philosophy. Yeah. And so um, I do think that it's very, there is a, a, a relation here. Deleuze is not necessarily a big fan of Plato, but in this case, I would, I would uh, I, this part of Plato, but also some texts by Descartes actually, that yeah. are actually much more, so it's very rare, but it does sometimes embrace uh, confusion. So then you have something that is more complex. And, and I, I, I always like to, like to remember that philosophy also is also that. Also, like ancient philosophy, is also about embracing the confusion, being also humble about it. Yeah. And, and, and how does that relate to... Um, uh, I'm hesitating a little bit because this might be completely... We might drift off completely. But don't... Be, 
people expect of us philosophers that we bring clarification and you are all the time talking about embracing complexity and uh, and not avoiding confusion and mm-hmm. so on isn't this really opposite mm-hmm. to the expectation that people have of, of us as philosophers mm-hmm. that we as uh, we are expected to bring clarity and delight yeah. And enlighten people. But that's also important. I mean, if, indeed, it's important also to specify that. It, it, it's ex- also Deleuze's point. If you just, if it's all about embracing confusion, well, indeed, I mean, then it's, it's going to be boring very fast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so it's it's about like kind of a back and forth. And so, indeed, uh, sometimes you have to let confusion in, but not. But it's not the, the last word. It's also sometimes, indeed, I, I propose the working definition. Uh, deconstructing definition, it also means that we start from concepts. So it's also always important, but I think it's always important to say it's a working definition. We are not giving, if you give this illusion that you have all the answers, then you create dumb people because they think that you know and that you are the one who knows and that they don't know. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's a very bad start. Mm-hmm. Um, having knowledge is important, of course. I mean, there are things to learn that's, uh, and there are things to teach. For sure, but it's not like the key to intelligence by contrast with people who would have no clue. <laughs> it's actually more of a dialogue. It should be more of a dialogue. That's the way I, I, mm-hmm. I, would, I would define it. But indeed, sometimes, Clary, I love, I love Descartes. Huh? Sometimes, Clary, I, that's why I was saying that yeah. Deleuze is actually a bit harsh. Because clarification is sometimes wonderful. Mm-hmm. I sometimes very much appreciate that a philosopher clarifies or gives a definition. Mm-hmm. Uh, but if it's the end word, end word, then I have a problem. If it's, if it's, then it's about creating a narrative about being the one who knows mm-hmm. everything, mm-hmm. which is bad. Okay. And uh, again, a different perspective, uh, because then we turn to the, to the audience. Um, uh, I was also thinking during your lecture, you also very briefly uh, referred to this, the French, your mother tongue, uh, the word bad means animal and st- stupid. Um, um, could, you, could you expand a little bit more on that, on, on, this, on this connection? Yeah, no, that's, that's an important uh, connection. So indeed in French, um, the adjective stupid is the word bête, so it's an adjective, but the noun bête in French, la bête, is the beast. So the adjective, as the adjective it means stupid, as a noun it means an animal. But animal in the sense of something that is entirely non-human. So it's also like a bet in French is also like, I don't really don't know what it is. It just looks uh, yeah. disgusting. Yeah. So uh, it's a bet. Uh, so, uh, and, and so it's again a word, and, and here I'm referring to Derrida. I haven't even mentioned his name. That's a, that's a shame because he's always in the background. Um, he wrote about uh, this disconnection between betise and, and, and stupidity. It's a good illustration of the fact that we are using words that are again pretty indeterminate or somehow that already that already uh, suggests that there is something wrong going on with a concept or maybe no concept but also it's also about our relation with animals and that's an important topic uh, in my mm-hmm. research indeed um, because of course you have this idea that uh, when you come when you call someone stupid you compare this person to a beast something or some, or some somehow and and as if animals were stupid, which is definitely not something obvious, it's again a scapegoat. So it was also about scapegoating not only some people in, in also groups of people in our societies, but the entire <laughs> animal kingdom. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was also that's also what the story of stupidity is about. Mm-hmm. It was also about creating this kind of um, archetype of something that is entirely different. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's the animals, and humans are intelligent, and that was also a very bad start in the history of the pseudo concepts of stupidity. So that's also what is—it's it's part of scapegoating. Yeah.